Welcome to the Your Mac Life Show, number 1066, 1066, uh, for this Wednesday, the 14th of October, 2015. And today, Sean will be talking about the new iMac and talking with, as always, Jim Dalrymple of The Loop at The Loop. Insight.com. No. no. Why do I always get that I wrong? I don't know. Why do you put the in front of the URL? Oh, it's just loop. Loopinsight.com. Loop Insight. Okay. Yeah, I might get it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the photography section, uh, he wants to talk about uh, living in the now. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Being, being in, in the, the moment. moment. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, here is um, Battle of Hastings, William the Conqueror, Sean King. <laughs> Hey folks, so we, we we had uh, 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 really we've had this several times over the last uh, several months. Funny discussion with uh, with Kim about the English language and her contention, and her contention is is based on uh, her uh, heritage that um, the brand of English that she speaks is the only one true brand of English. Is not is that not correct? When I speak correctly, it is. My my elocution teacher, how I was taught to speak then, that's correct English. Not the way I speak isn't correct English. Now, you just said something that the vast majority of mm. us in North America have no clue what it means. You elocution? Said el el no, no. We, shut up. We know what elocution means. Shut up. But your elocution teacher, you actually had a class in school yeah. called elocution? You had to pay extra for it. And you did really? exams. Really? Yeah. How do you do exam and elocution? Do you say words out loud? No, you have to... Depending on which grade and level you're doing, yeah. you have to um, either learn two poems off by heart and say them with lots of emphasis and meaning and emphasis, emphasis on the wrong syllable. Yes, um, or it could be you do one poem and then you have to do a speech, and the topic or the subject matter is given to you at the time of the examination so you don't know ahead of time you can't practice there no. ahead of time no you just have to know how to <coughs> stand and speak clearly well wait wait enunciate. wait what does standing have to do with elocution because if you stand correctly and you hold your shoulders back and you're balanced then you can speak and enunciate and clear and project your voice better did they put a book in your head nope but it's that kind of thing yeah uh, you'd never read like that dave dave says uh, you have to speak with marbles in your mouth no, that would be some people talk with plums in their Pl mouth. <laughs> you call that plummy. Yeah, plum th in th your that mouth. British accent that we hear from actors and from Hooray um, Henrys. What? <laughs> Hooray Henrys. <laughs> Hooray Henrys talk with a plum in their mouth. So that's the kind of folks who are uh, who are what you call presenters or like the Queen or, or TV anchor people mm. uh, speak. No, no, because there's there's some well spoken English people that. Um, is 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 a nice accent, but but like the Queen, people that talk like the Queen, mm -hmm. that's just uh, that's hooray Henrys and <laughs> plum in your mouth, yeah. Because Nobody talks like that. we have a version of that here in North America for our news anchors. Mm -hmm. They all sound the exact same. They're actually taught to speak what's called a Midwest English. It's supposedly oh. the least um, uh, accented and and most neutral way of of speaking, and. I was reminded of this because uh, Kim, Kim and I were talking about I was out wandering around yesterday, and I saw a pawn shop. And I love pawn shops because you can sometimes find cool deals there, especially on things like cameras and lenses and stuff like that. So whenever I see a pawn shop, I don't stomp in. And when Kim said it, she she said what she said made me go, wait, what? And so you said, when I'm talking about P-A-W-N. Yeah, pawn. Now, doesn't everyone in the audience right now heard her say P O R N porn? No. Porn. You see, uh, we all hear porn. Mm -hmm. See, Brian Monroe says porn's what Kim said. Because Brian Monroe likes shit stirring. But now, <laughs> well, this is true, he does. But yeah, see, Sherry, that's porn. Mm -hmm. Everyone porn. else, everyone else hears hears her say it again. Porn. Okay, say pawn shop. A porn shop. Say porn shop. Porn shop. See, it's the same word. <laughs> we're yeah. all we're all hearing the exact same it is word. It's pronounced the same. There must, there, I might pronounce the porn 
a bit more in the actual porn shop. But it's not a pawn shop like you guys say. But at least when we say pawn shop, it differentiates it from porn shop. And then say a different word. Call it, it something else. Secondhand store. But it's not a secondhand store. The difference between a secondhand store and a pawn shop. Mm. Do you know the difference? Yeah. What's the difference? Because you can't trade things in and get money okay. and then pay it back. I know what a fucking pawn shop is. Uh, six minutes in for the first curse word from Kim. If you were, if if, if you had that on the pool, you won. <laughs> mm-hmm. We um. Brian said I should be fired. I said I'm too late. I already am. No, you're not fired. You're not fired. Not yet. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, in the starting point photography segment. And there was two things that that got me thinking about this. And, uh, one of these stories happened, uh, I guess, a week ago. No, t- almost a month ago. Now it's been it's been a while since we've uh, since we talked about this. But it was the I've lost Kim. No, I haven't. Hey, hang on a second. Hang on a second. Let me do this. It was the um, the Pope's visit to the United States of America, um, which, except for a couple of unfortunate instances, uh, seemed to have gone quite well for His Holiness, and. The best part about it, I didn't know this was happening. I think Sly was watching it <coughs> live on TV, and I saw her Twitter feed, sorry, her, her her Facebook post about this. And Sly pointed out the fact that <coughs> she thought it was cute as hell that the pontiff was riding around a little Fiat 500. That's <laughs> ah, awesome. He was riding around <laughs> this little teeny tiny car. If you're watching the video on the on the show, the um, you can see the, the 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 pontiff's car is dwarfed by the gigantic SUVs of the American Secret Service and other security forces. It was just screamingly funny to see, and then so then I had to watch the video, and there's there's a bunch of videos on this uh, on this website of the Pope getting in this, this little tiny tiny little car, <laughs> just and the little tiny car going out in the motorcade. Now, there's the president in what they call the Beast, which is the gigantic eight-ton armored, I think the Lincoln, armored Lincoln Continental that the, the president rides in. And here's here's the the, the pontiff riding around in a little Fiat 500 they might have bought yesterday. <laughs> and now, granted, it's the big Fiat. It's the 500L, which is the big, supersized Fiat. But still, this is a compact car. And someone made a really interesting point. They said that they they really couldn't, the Pope really couldn't show up and drive off in a big luxury SUV or limousine because he is this, his image that he's trying to craft, I don't know how successful he is, but certainly the image he's trying to craft is that he's one of the people, that he is one of the little people. He is um, a simple man who likes simple things. So it really wouldn't do to have His Holiness pull up in this in a in a, in a giant SUV when, mm. and it's also it's an Italian car too. Italian, the, the Fiat the Fiat is, is an Italian car. So Macman says, sure he could. Nobody would blame him if the Secret Service ushered him into an armored limo. I I think some people would blame him, and I don't think he'd want to go in the armored limo. I think this was his choice. I think this is him making a statement. Not to embarrass anybody else, not to embarrass the president. For I think he should walk everywhere in sandals. <laughs> That's right. He'd never go to the Vatican City, but I, I I think it's really interesting. And so our our um, talk on being in the moment later on for starting point photography will be a, a, a tangentially about that and some of the pictures I saw. And again, thanks to Sly for uh, pointing out the uh, the story of the the pontiffs. Little teeny tiny Pope Mobile, which I think is just just so so cute. It was painfully cute that this guy is riding around in this little tiny car. Um, as always, we encourage you guys to go to our website. It, what was that? Nothing. Did you scoop? I might have. <laughs> For any particular reason? No. <laughs> you know I can hear you, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know your mics are on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, just just checking. Uh, as always, we encourage you to go to the website, yourmaclifeshow.com. Left-hand side there, you can subscribe to Your Mac Life for 2 5 10 15 bucks a month, whatever you so choose. 
That money goes into my PayPal account, and I use it to pay bills. So please do that if you would like. I'd appreciate it if you did. As always, if you're listening to the show and not in the IRC chat room, our friend Monty has made it really, really easy. If you're watching the video on YouTube or on the yourmaclifeshow.com website, scroll down a little bit further, and below the video, you will see a really, really easy way to get into the IRC chat room. You don't have to know anything about IRC. <clears throat> I had somebody email me last week about what the IRC was, and it's only for the live show. So if you're listening to the uh, uh, the, uh, the archive of it, you're, you're not getting the IRC. But it's real easy. Monty set this up so it's brain-dead simple to uh, jump into the IRC chat room and chat to the folks there. And even if you don't know anything about IRC, don't worry about it. Kim knows nothing about IRC, and yet she participates on a regular basis. With uh, it wasn't, It's not too scary in there, is it, for you? That's cool. That's it. That's all I'm getting. Mm. All right, thanks. Um, all kinds of conversations go on in the IRC chat room. You can also ask questions, too, so please do that. And uh, also, as always, please send us emails to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com. If you want us to read your email on the show or if you want to comment on anything we have been saying on the show or during the week, send me emails to sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. We've got some emails from you guys we'll read a little bit later on in the show. If you are going to get a new iMac, let me know. Are you in the market for a new iMac? The Apple announced yesterday a new 21-inch 4K Retina Display iMacs and new 27-inch 5K Retina Display iMacs. And Jim Downpool from the Loop at loopinsight.com uh, has had one of the has had both of these for about a week. And we'll talk to him about those. Also, there's some new accessories: a new trackpad a new Magic Mouse, and a new keyboard. And we'll talk to Jim about those, too. So if you have any questions for Jim, send them off to us to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com. We'll do our best to get those questions into Jim before we finish up with him. So uh, we're going to do the starting point photography segment, but up next, we're going to talk to our good friend Jim Downpool from The Loop at loopinsight.com. This is Your Mac Life. <laughs> Welcome back, folks. This is Your Mac Life. I am Sean King, now on the phone with our good friend from The Loop, Jim Darnpole at loopinsight.com. Jim, how you doing? I'm good, Sean. How are you? I am good. Thanks very much for joining us. As always, uh, you've had a, your hands, your hot little furry hands on the new IMAX. You got both the 21-inch and 27-inch display models from Apple, didn't you? Uh, no. I oh. had a 21. 21, okay. Now, one of the things that, that I, but I I did have I I did have my hands on the on the twenty seven. Twenty seven. I don't have that one. Okay. Did, one of the things that I thought was interesting, you, you, there's no review yet. Your review will be up in in a, in a good and timely fashion as usual. So you don't have a review up just yet. You have some some quick comments about it. One of the things I was most curious about, especially as so many of us, and I got to assume Apple's market gets a little bit older. You said, and Apple says, that you can actually see the difference on these new 4K retina displays because of the wider color again, what Apple calls P3. Is that true? Yeah. Can, you actually see, can you actually see the difference in not just Apple's photos, 
What photos that you've taken yourself? I'm telling you, if you have a, um, you can see the difference. I mean, if you're going and looking at these pictures, Apple had a uh, a thing set up where it would show you what the color um, range was under sRGB, yeah, and then the color range under um, uh, P3, mm-hmm. and P3 is is this, uh, you know the high end cameras, movie studios, things like that. They they've captured that stuff forever. Uh, so you know you can actually see this stuff. So that that's I mean specs don't mean much to me, but when you can actually show me visually that here's what this does, then that's a big difference. The uh, the physical form factor is the exact same. Apple hasn't changed anything on the outside of either of these, have they? It's if you you couldn't spot the mm. difference side by side, could you? Why why would they? I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know they're pretty they're they're pretty uh, well designed, I think. So no no need for big changes. The internals haven't changed a whole lot either, except for the display, right? That the is still um, uh, it's got a new. Um, Intel Core processor, so it's going to be faster. This is the usual Correct. upgrade Apple has done with these iMacs, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, it, as far as that goes, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, new new uh, processor, but the uh, bringing Retina to the 21 inch, I think, was huge. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a. a a big change and, you know, making the entire 27 inch line 5k. Yeah. Now, doesn't that making the, the, the bigger ones 5k and the smaller ones 4k, that's great, but doesn't, isn't, wasn't 4k the the latest, greatest thing? When did 5k become something? Is it going to be 7k going to be the next big thing? I mean, did Apple explain this whole K thing to you? Well, I can't tell you that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know either. I was hoping someone could help me out, man. <laughs> the, yeah, uh, I, you know, I, I don't even know what would capture anything beyond what we have. You know, the um, performance of them is. We'll see the 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 Geek Bench and the and the Mac Bench and all the other benchmarks from Ars Technica and MacWorld and all the usual nerd type places. Do you notice any difference just using them in your Ordinary average day, everyday work. Well, it's fast. No, it's it's fast. I mean, there's nothing that um, that you're going to be able to do that these machines can't handle. But I, I see. I think that's the way it's been for uh, for quite some time, even on the laptop. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's there's very little that the normal person would want to do. I understand that there's scientific things. And, and all of that that, you know, may run the machines down. But uh, the normal person is going to go out and buy an iMac, and it, the thing's going to fly. Now, uh, Brian Monroe had a bit of a beef in the IRC chat room before the, the show began, and it's kind of understandable. Let me, let me get your thoughts on this. He's kind of miffed that Apple didn't make the SSD drive standard across the line. Do you agree with that, that Apple should be making that a standard? Well, I, I think that comes down to uh, pricing. Yep. You know, Apple's got to got to leave uh, some room so that you know people will be able to buy an iMac. People that don't really care about SSD. Yep. Um, people that don't care about a Retina display, and there are plenty of them. Sure. You know, there there are a lot of people that do, but there are a lot of people that just want a Mac because you know they've always wanted a Mac, or you know. Uh, you know, it, it, photography, I love photography. I love taking pictures. I suck at it. I uh, love taking 4K videos. Still suck at that, too. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't mind having a machine that will do all that. So, for me, I would probably get one of those. Um, but, you know, for me, it's audio. So, I need power. It has the power to do this. Um, but there are going to be people that just, they just want to email and, you know, surf the web and do some FaceTime things and stuff like that. It's going to be perfect for them. 
Yeah, I think, and this is what I said to Brian at the pre-show, as you said, Apple needs to have some sort of uh, a room in order to make money off these low ends, and, and putting in more expensive drives isn't the way to do that. And the other thing is, the vast majority of folks who, who the target market for the low-end iMac is would never notice the difference between a 5,400 RPM right. physical drive and an SSD drive. So it's kind of throwing money at them or throwing performance at them that they're not going to need that you can expect them to pay for. Well, and that's just it. You expect them to pay. So um, I, I don't have an issue. I, you know, if Apple did bring the Retina. They did uh, allow you to, to have some upgrades, they, you know, all the normal stuff that they do. And I think that's the best way to do it. Just yeah. they can't ignore a piece of the market, exactly. you know. Now, the, the, what might be even more interesting were the uh, the accessories that Apple announced also along with the new iMacs, the new keyboard, mouse, and uh, trackpad. I assume you've got uh, copies of those in your hands? I do. I never thought I'd be excited about accessories. <laughs> <laughs> and why are you excited about accessories? Well, I mean, I take just just some of the little things. If you take the mouse and look at the mouse is, is easier to glide now. It glides better than it did before. Yeah. But I so said that's that's nice. But the big thing is the battery. It doesn't have uh, you know pop out batteries, just so disposable batteries anymore. Yeah. It has lithium ion batteries. So you just charge it. Now that's a great thing. And when they showed it to me the charging port, the lightning port, was on the bottom. And I said, well, how am I supposed to use that if my mouse runs it? <laughs> you know? And a two-minute charge will give you two hours of use. I find that hard to believe. You plug it in for two minutes, walk away, and, you know, get a drink out of the fridge or something, come back, you've got two hours of use. Yeah. Plug it in for two hours, you've got... Uh, 30 days of use. So basically, Same plug for the in, rest of them. basically plug it in <clears throat> each night or every every few nights, and you and you'll be fine. Well, I'm plugging in every month. Yeah. Because you've got 30 days of use. 30 days, not 30 hours. The mouse feels the same as the previous ones. Uh, pretty much, yeah. The trackpad. Now, I've never been. I tried the trackpad when it first came out. I've never been a trackpad fan, so I can't speak to the trackpad. I'm not a. I'm not a gestures user on on the desktop or things like that. Um, but the trackpad is there anything special about the trackpad besides the, this new lightning connection? Uh, trackpad is about thirty percent bigger mm -hmm. in, in space. It brings force touch to the Mac. Big deal there. Uh, to the desktop, yeah. so uh, that's good. Um, you know. Uh, the trackpad is just i it's got that that really nice surface where you know you can click anywhere but you're not really clicking because it's that you know that really weird uh thing that they did on the mac yeah that's freak a you. that's a really weird voodoo thing man i still haven't gotten used to that yeah yeah i know yeah uh the keyboard is uh probably the biggest change yeah. the keyboard has a a 3 degree tilt now instead of a 6 degree um, it still has scissor mechanism keys, but the the mechanism they they revamped the mechanism and redid it, and they lowered the key travel from 2.1 millimeters on the old Apple keyboards to one millimeter on these ones, which is closer to what the MacBook has. Um, with I think, key travel. Isn't the issue there though? Is that that's that's great if you liked that MacBook. A lot of folks aren't so crazy about the lack of key travel. I think I think part of it just through muscle memory. We're so used to a certain amount of play in the keyboards. Keyboards are so personal. I've used different keyboards over the years, and there's some I absolutely hate and some I absolutely love, and it's because of the feel. And I think the 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 this new version of of the keyboard is going to appeal to some folks, but won't appeal to everybody. Uh, I don't know. I think that there's enough key travel. Now, the key travel for the MacBook is half a millimeter. Yeah, yeah. This one, this one is a millimeter. So I think there's enough key travel to satisfy everybody. But there's not um, a crazy amount of key travel. You know, you don't need all of it. And 
you know, I like the MacBook, and I'm right, so that only leaves one other thing for everybody else to be. Yeah, that's fair. You know, if that's the way you look at the world, I got I can't disagree with you on that. Well, Jesus, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what, what's the price point of these? I think it's it was ninety nine bucks for the keyboard, or is it one thirty for the keyboard? Um, keyboard and mouse were around. I, I think the prices were seventy nine ninety nine and one twenty nine for the maybe the the key uh, the trackpad, maybe. Yeah, I just I just saw that in the bottom of your story on uh, loopinsight dot com. Magic Magic Keyboard ninety nine bucks. Magic Mouse two is seventy nine bucks. And the Magic Trackpad 2 is available today starting for $129. Yikes, that's a lot of money. There was a really interesting uh, article over at uh, Medium.com from a very well-known journalist, Stephen Levy, who's been around longer than God uh, covering Apple. He got some really interesting behind-the-scenes access to the team that created this new iMac. Funny story about the the new mouse and why I was making the wrong noise. And I'll leave you to read the story to understand what that means. A lot of us picked up on a comment that Phil Schiller made. I want to get your thoughts on Schiller's comment. He said, Schiller, in fact, has a grand philosophical theory of the Apple product line that puts all products on a continuum. Ideally, Schiller said, you should be using the smallest possible gadget to do as much as possible before going to the next largest gizmo in line. Do you agree with him? Do you think that's the way that you should be looking at these kinds of gadgets and computers? I don't. I, I don't even know what that means. Yeah, I was hoping you would explain. It. <laughs> well, maybe you talked to Phil. You know, you saw him in the pub. You, he bought you a Heineken. You know, that's, that's what I was thinking about. I don't know. I don't uh, know. I don't. I'm sorry. He says they're all computers. Each one is offering computers something unique. And each is made with a simple form that is pretty eternal. The job of the watch is to do more things on your wrist. The job of the phones do more things such that maybe you don't need your iPad. The job of the iPad should be to, so powerful and capable you don't need a notebook, blah, 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 all the way up the line. The, 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 the basic point, and you can read the story for the rest of it, is what's the job of a desktop? Nowadays, so many of us don't need a desktop anymore. I mean, when's the last time, Jim, that you use the desktop as your regular everyday machine? Well, see, it's a little bit different. Uh, I may be in a different position because I still love the desktop. Um, do I need one? Yes, I do for audio. Yeah. Uh, I need I need to be able to, to do that stuff. I want a large screen. I want, you know, power. Um, so, yeah, uh, for me, that's great. I think that there there are a lot of people out there that still love to have desktops. And we're, we're not out of that market yet. You know, I mean, people like to to talk about going from, um, uh, you know, the desktop to a laptop to an iPad, and that's all they use. And I, I don't think the majority of us are there yet. No. I really don't. I so, think, yeah, there's there's still lots of room. I think for me, the key to the the usefulness of a desktop is the giant screen. The fact that you can get a 27-inch monitor now, or even a 21-inch monitor, which is very, very large if you've been using a laptop. I think for those folks who need screen real estate, whether they be audio and video editors, whether they be Photoshop users, whether they be graphic designers, those kinds of folks who need to see two pages side by side. But the vast majority of the markets no longer needs that. They, They can get by if they're just browsing the web or just using email, a MacBook Air is a perfectly good machine for them. That's why when I've talked to people nowadays about buying a computer, the most important thing is what are you going to use it for? Because if you need to do video editing, well, then obviously you need something that's got processing power and a big screen. But if all you're doing is checking email and and you're on Facebook and and Twitter and and reading web pages and you want portability, you want to be able to do that stuff on the couch or outside or in the airport, then a laptop is a much better use for most people. I think this is really coming true, Steve Jobs' prediction that desktops were trucks. We're always going to need trucks. Not everyone needs a truck, though. And Apple's going to continue to make money selling trucks. Well, yeah, and, and you know, there's not everybody is going to need them. That's absolutely true. But um, I think that a lot of people uh, will feel more comfortable using a desktop than they will 
uh, using a laptop. Yeah. You know, um, whether they're older people or younger people or whatever, uh, I think that there are a certain segment of the market that will will like that much better. Let's move on. You uh, you posted an interesting story on the loop. Apple launches Apple Music Help Twitter account, which is not the story, but your comment. I bought what I thought was interesting. It doesn't seem like a good sign when you have to launch a support account for your new music service, especially when you're known around the world for ease of use. Do you want to walk back that statement, or are you sticking with it? Why would I walk that back? Well, because it doesn't seem to be very fair. Apple's got support forms and accounts for all kinds of di- other different things, too. OS ten and the iPad, and, and there's not 800 numbers. You, you, you're saying you're equating ease of use with... <clears throat> And with a uh, uh, the ease of use means you don't need support. That's not true. Why do you have a problem with Apple no. having a music help Twitter account? Because Apple Music is broken. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm not going to disagree with you on that, but so are a lot of other things, and you don't slam Apple for having support for those things. Yeah, but I love music. <laughs> I see, because this is your particular hobby horse. You're you're jumping and whipping Apple about it. I got it. Okay, right, exactly. <laughs> I know. mean, really, I I think that <laughs> that uh, it's it's broken, and I think that you know people brought up that Spotify has uh, a Twitter account, a help Twitter account, yep. and Audio has a help Twitter account. Well, of course they do. The product sucks, <laughs> you know. I mean, but Apple is is supposed to be the ones that think this stuff through to the point where you don't need any manuals and you don't need help because it just works. Well, that's not the case. No, it's not the case. But that and you saying that is setting up setting up your own straw man. Apple has support for all kinds of other different things. They have support for for the iPod, for Christ's sake. And that's got to be the simplest device that Apple makes. There's going to be a support page for the new Magic Mouse. Apple has support for a lot of things. Ease oh, of no, use no, does no, not, no, mean, not doesn't not, mean support. Not support pages. Not support pages. And take a look at the account and see what's happening. I mean, these are some some big and valid complaints that people are having about music. So, yeah, but people would have those complaints if Apple did a a Magic Mouse Twitter account. To me, what's interesting is Apple is doing this. On Twitter. That to me is what I find really interesting. I think this is the first time that I've seen Apple using Twitter in this kind of way. And it's interesting. I think it's interesting that they're using uh, Apple Music to do this and doing it on Twitter. That to me, I think, is a more interesting story than the fact they've got a, a well, support uh, account and, for. And th- that's why I said to you a minute ago, hold on, hold on, because we're not talking about an Apple support web page yeah. or I would I would expect Apple to have that. We're talking a Twitter account where, where they're interacting with people. Um, they felt that that was necessary because they're having so many problems. I, You know, I disagree with that. I don't think they felt it was necessary because they're having so many different problems. I don't think they're having any more or fewer problems than anything else. I think that this is... I don't is... care if you disagree. <laughs> I think this is Apple reaching out, taking little baby steps because they were they've been they are notorious for not being on social media. It was only since the passing of Steve Jobs that they got involved in social media in any kind of real significant way. You see Phil Schiller actually tweeting back and forth. You see Eddie Q actually dialoguing with people on Twitter. And I can't believe I just said the word dialogue. I mean, please, someone shoot me. So I I think this is another baby step to Apple taking that next step of of looking to other social media to help their customers. Okay, well, you know, we disagree. Okay. Wouldn't be the first time, won't be the um, last time. Will not, definitely. I can guarantee <laughs> you will not. I promise you this will not be the last time. The, the Speaking of, of, of Twitter, and let me know what you th- what whether or not you think this is a good thing or not. Uh, Quartz, a lot of other folks have uh, mentioned this. There's a new chairman of the board of Twitter. Twitter just named Omid Kordistani as executive chairman of its board of directors. But he's only got 11 tweets as of this morning, including some announcing his own new role. He doesn't seem to be a big <laughs> user of the company's products. Is that a problem? Well, I think so, but, you know. 
there's a thing in, there's a thing in tech called eating your own dog food. What it means is that you use the products that your company creates. And while some folks are willing to give this guy a pass on this, I don't think you can because I don't believe that you can understand a company or a service or a product unless you use that company's services and products. This guy doesn't use Twitter in the way that even Twitter would assume that you'd use Twitter. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's important that whoever the guy is does use it. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But I think part of the problem is that, as the story goes on to say, he's not even the least active member of Twitter's board. That honor belongs to MacArthur Foundation's Marjorie Scardino. She's only tweeted nine times. Uh, Peter Curry has only tweeted 116 times. This, I think this might go to the heart of why Twitter doesn't seem to be able to get as much traction as Twitter and Wall Street wants them to get because their board of directors don't use the products. Yeah, well, that's a that's a very valid point, I think. Dave, I mean, how are they supposed to give advice and, you know, not what's right or wrong if they don't even use it? Dave D says, Sean, do you think the chairman of the Bo- chairman of Boeing has to fly 787s? Well, no, he doesn't have to, to fly them, but I bet he, he gets on one. I'll bet he understands how they fly. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. And I think, I I think, I, 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 yeah, I, I think he's been on them and he knows how they fly. He knows the inside of a, of a 747. I don't know how to code Twitter either, but it doesn't mean I, I don't use it and wouldn't be a, a, a candidate for the chairman of the board. If this guy with only 11 tweets, he's used it as much as he's flown a 787. I don't think that's. I think that's. I, I think. I think it's. I think I'm going to be on the board of Twitter. Exactly. I think it's a bad analogy. He's he's been in 787s. I think it's more of a accurate analogy, uh, Dave. If he if you were talking about coding Twitter, I would not expect him. No, I would not expect him to know how to code Twitter's website or code uh, a, a Twitter app. That would be beyond my expectations. But for him to actually use the product, just like the chairman of the board of Boeing uses. 787s. He's been in 787s. He's flown with qualified pilots of 787. I think that's a more apt analogy, and 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 f- f- it falls down when you use it in that way. I don't know. It just it, so. ju- it just bothered me a little bit that uh, this guy who's supposed to be uh, at least helping run the company or 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 direct the company as chairman of the board. The board of directors directs the company. The CEO carries out those directives. The chairman of that company doesn't use the product and therefore really can't understand the direction of it. I think there's also always been a big disconnect between how we use Twitter and the way Twitter, the company, wants it to be used. I think that's that's shown many, many times by some of the decisions they've made with regards to killing various kinds of apps and um, doing autoplay videos and and uh, advertisements, that kind of stuff that the user base obviously doesn't want. But Twitter has to do because they're a business and they have to monetize this kind of stuff. So it's uh, Monty says, playing devil's advocate, maybe the new Twitter chairman has only made 11 tweets from his public account, but has a private one that he uses a lot more. That's certainly possible. True. Certainly possible. True. Uh, Dave D. Sean, don't you think that Carly Fiorino uses used Apple, used HP products? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah, probably not. I mean, who would? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so how much She's more than that? How much more time do you think it's going to be, Jim, before you start driving around there in California in a driverless car? It's going to be a long time. A long time? Do you think within your lifetime? Oh, I'm not. I'm not going to drive a driverless car. Why would I do that? What, do you, and isn't that going to be part of the problem that we have to? It's got to be. It feels like it's got to be an all-or-nothing thing. Was, I, the reason I brought this up was I read an article over at TechPinions.com from uh, Tim Bajaran about the ethics of driverless cars and how the ethical considerations are going to have to be a big deal. It got me thinking that <clears throat> we've heard about all these accidents of uh, with Google cars and all the accidents have been human error on the part of the other people and not the car itself, that they have to redesign the cars to be more aggressive, to be less cautious. Isn't part of the problem going to be with driverless cars that we're going to have a mix 
of driverless cars and cars with human beings in them, and human beings being the jerks they are, especially behind the wheel, will cause problems for driverless cars? Could be. Because isn't I, I know you. I know you. You're going to pull up in front of a driverless car and jam your brakes on, aren't you? I am. You, <laughs> you got to cut a driverless car <laughs> off in traffic. We all are. We all want to see how the damn thing's going to react. We all want to just like merge into its lane and see what's going to happen because we're assholes. <laughs> yeah, there's and well, there's especially out here. There's a lot of really, really bad drivers. Really bad drivers. So, do, do you think it's going to have to come down to a point where we're going to have special lanes in the highway that the, maybe the fast lane will be, only be for autonomous driverless cars? And that'll I'll be messing with them. <laughs> Just drive alongside one so, oh. he, so he can't merge. Yeah, oh yeah. We're all gonna do it. We are absolutely all going to mess with driverless cars. There's just no way. I, I mean, personally, I can't wait. I want to see more driverless cars because I ride a motorcycle. And like you said, people are generally bad drivers. And driverless car, I trust a driverless car to drive according to the rules of the road and do things I expect much more than I would ever trust. A non-driverless car, a, non -dri a driver car. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't doubt that a bit. Uh, Binky points out the current CEO of Boeing has a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics, so he could probably fly a 787. Smart guy. I'm just guessing. Yeah, he's a, he's a whole lot, whole lot smarter than we are. Um, it's, there's just been all kinds of stories recently about, about driverless cars and, and, uh, where they're going and when they're going to, when they're going to get here. I don't think we're going to see them even at 25% of the population of cars on the road in our lifetimes. I think it's going to be well beyond that before the laws change, before attitudes change, before so many other things change that will get people. Cause one of the things is, I think, and tell me if you, if you agree with me on this, Jim, one of the things that driverless, autonomous car advocates don't get is a lot of us like driving. We like being in that yeah. cocoon of power. We like having that, that power behind the wheel, that, that gas pedal and that acceleration and the braking and the speed. A lot of us like that, even if we don't want to admit it. I love it. it. I, oh, I, I love it. That's where I want to be. I think that's you know. one of the reasons why people ride motorcycles is for that sensation of speed and acceleration, certainly danger too with, with a motorcycle that you're not going to obviously not going to get from driverless cars. Driverless cars is going to be, I, I think that's where we'll see driverless cars. I think we'll see driverless cars first in the realm of taxis and driverless Uber kind of stuff, as opposed to the car that you and I are going to drive to, to go to work. I think we'll, we'll see taxi cabs, in major cities, L.A. first, San, sorry, San Francisco first, L.A., before we see them in the road with the average person. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that, that's, that's very reasonable. If somebody gave you a driverless car right now and said that it would work perfectly, would you drive it or would you get into it? Oh, oh boy, I don't know. I don't know about that. I think part of it is is you have to understand where that person's coming from in his present driving. If you're a commuter, if when I lived in, in Connecticut and I watched folks go from Connecticut into New York City every morning, an hour and a half on I-95 in the Merritt Parkway, those people, 99% of them would say, oh, God, yes, give me a driverless car. But if you drive for pleasure, if you enjoy driving, if you are not in an hour-long commute every morning, I think those people probably still like driving. Yeah, they, I mean... I I really really like to drive. Yeah. I really do. You know, so I've always liked to drive. So for me, it's not it's not a thing. You know, a driverless car so that you don't have to drive. Well, why would I want that? Yeah, Arxine says, Sean, will you drive? I don't want that. Arxine says, Sean, will you ride a driverless motorcycle? They're never going to have those. But no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't drive a driverless anything either a motorcycle or a car, because I'm like Jim, I love the act of driving. I enjoy driving. I enjoy riding a motorcycle even more, but I love getting in a car and driving a car. I really enjoy the whole prospect of it, the whole aspect of it, even if it's just going down to the store to, to, to get groceries. 
Uh, I go out in the motorcycle to get groceries all the time, and it'll take an hour and a half to go 20 minutes. Same with a car. If I had a, yep. a car, I would do the same thing. I go the long way around to get to places. So, yeah, I, w- I would never need or want any kind of autonomous vehicle. No, me neither. I just, I don't have any. And, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with, with getting in the car and driving. Folks, we're talking to Jim Jarrell from The Loop at loopinsight.com. His Amplified podcast is up on the iTunes store as we speak, as is the Dalroom Report. Check it out on iTunes. Jim, thanks for joining me, buddy. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Sean. Have a good night. See ya. Thanks, Jim. Let me just uh, cut Jim off. Kim, turn your microphone back on. We'll talk a little bit more about this whole driverless thing. Kim's mic is coming on as we speak. And there she is. I'm on. You are. Um, what are your thoughts on, on driverless vehicles? Yeah, I think I think it's a good idea, but I think it'll just become, it's like getting on a um, sky train, but it'll be like a taxi. Yeah? Interesting. The to roads. Bring, yeah. it's, it's no different than catching a train or, or a sky train or a tube yeah, or underground, whatever your subway, whatever you want to call it. Do we feel, I think we feel safer in a sky train or a subway than we would in a driverless car, though, wouldn't we? Only because you, it's on a track. Well, yeah. if we have driverless uh, cars, it's going to be something similar to a track. It's, it's going to be no, a kind of, well, it's not a track, but it's going to be um, some kind of magnetic field. No, it won't. It, it, it won't just be able to drive anywhere. Yes, it will. No, it won't. Yep. <laughs> That's how driverless cars are working now. No, it won't. <coughs> Folks, someone correct her. The only way, the, 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 the track idea that you're talking about is more efficient, but it means ripping up every single piece of road mm. in North America. They're not going to do that. What they're doing now with driverless cars is the cars have monitors and sensors all around them, cameras basically. Yeah. And the computer inside the car says, looks at the, looks at the camera and says, okay, that's a white line, that's a yellow line, I'll stay between these two lines. Good luck with that in Canada. There's no <laughs> fucking lines anywhere. It'll also be able to tell how far away it is from, because GPS and all kinds of other things, how far away it will be from the shoulder of the road. Yeah, if that's what they're going to rely on, no. <laughs> that, that, no. that is what they're going to rely on. No, it won't work. Why not? There's there's too many variations. There's a hedgerow, there's a curb. Sometimes there's a curb, sometimes there's a fog line, sometimes there isn't, sometimes there's a shoulder, sometimes there isn't. Sidewalk, buildings, not buildings, river, cliff edge, rock face. Ugh, no, no, <laughs> no. Going from A to B on a freeway, I would possibly trust a driverless car. Mm-hmm. Something straight, simple, basic. But anywhere else, nope. I'm driving myself. I think that's what's going to happen. First of all, we'll we'll see a version of taxi cabs or and or Ubers that will be driverless. That will because that way you will have fewer of them on the road, um, and we'll have more of them on the road where we need them. Mm. One of the mo- most mind blowing things I remember seeing in New York City was my first Mac MacWorld Expo. I was there, and I went to uh, uh, we were staying at the Marriott in Times Square, and my room had a gorgeous gorgeous view. Of Times Square. I couldn't get any sleep because there was nothing but light. But we, I looked down. We were on the 33rd floor. I looked down onto Times Square. And at one point I looked down, I saw nothing but yellow cabs. There was no other cars mm. in the four blocks except for yellow cabs. It was really mind-boggling. That would be a perfect place for driverless cabs, driverless cars. In in New York City, where you have these cars where the, where the roads are fairly well di- – delineated not great but there 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 are white lines everywhere and people can just flag down or call on their on their app a car i can't see it being average everyday people just yet and i don't think for a long time we're gonna have a lot of legislation that's gonna be passed there's got a lot it, everything from your local municipality to the county to the state to the federal government are all gonna have to weigh in on safety legality present laws versus future laws. It's, it's, going be, it's going to be a long time. The geeks and nerds think this is going to happen in the next five years. It's not. It's not going to happen, I don't think, for the next 25 years that we'll see 25% of the road, of cars on the road be driverless cars. I just can't see it happening just yet. Um, DJ McIntosh makes a good point. I'm not able to drive due to my vision, so I have no idea what it feels like to control a metal beast. I would like a self-driving car if I didn't need a driver's license to operate it. 
that's the way in the future when the driverless cars become reliable. Certainly, there's a, a good percentage of people out there who love the idea of driverless cars for that reason, because for whatever reason, they can't drive. They have some sort of, um, uh, I don't know if disability is the right word, but let's use disability, or they just don't want to drive. You know, Sly is a perfect example. Sly does not want to drive. Sly has no interest in driving. And we live in a city in Vancouver. She lives in a city in Vancouver. It's got decent public transit, so she's okay with taking public transit. Other folks, for whatever reason, whether it's, as DJ says, he, he, he has vision issues, so he, he can't drive. People who have gotten too old to drive. People who don't want the cost of learning to drive. Whatever it might be. There's all kinds of folks. That's still not a large percentage of the population, or at least a large enough percentage of the population. The other issue, too, is we have to pass laws preventing people doing what Jim and I said we were going to do, which is mess with driverless cars. Because you know yahoos are going to do exactly that. I'm, Jim and I were joking. But you know someone's going to pull up in front of your driverless car and jam the brakes on to see how your car reacts. Hmm. They're going to merge into the driverless car's lane. The other thing is going, to, is going to happen. I'm going down the road. I see the car next to me is a driverless car. I want to exit in 200 feet. I'm going to cut the driverless car off. Because I know the driverless car will stop. He will brake and let me in. Mm. Whereas if we're both driver's cars, you've got to get screw you. You've got to get permission from, from that other guy. Mm -hmm. You can signal all you want. <laughs> Signaling is not an order, it's a request. No. And I don't have to grant that request. So we could go down and, and, and you'd miss your exit. But with driverless cars, people are just gonna turn. Mm. Because they know the driverless car will be designed to break and allow you in. So people are going to become worse drivers because of this. And what's going to happen is the driverless car is going to slam its brakes on. The guy behind the driverless car isn't going to pay attention. He's going to rear end the driverless car. Yeah. And that's why it's like you said, it's got to be all or nothing, I think. <laughs> Brian Monroe says, I'm not sure you can pass laws with that stuff. Yeah, well, you can, you can, uh, you can, Better, not better, but you can, you can, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Enforce the laws we have now of dangerous driving. That would be considered dangerous driving. And certainly a driverless car would have cameras on it that would be able to identify the car that cut them off. You know, it'll be able to take a license plate number or things like that. Uh, but people are still going to do it. It's going to be called dangerous driving, and you may be able to increase the penalties, but you know, people are going to. How can you prove it, Sean? Well, again, there'll be cameras on the driverless car, is that when a driverless car, one thing a driverless car will be able to do is record everything around it for the previous 10 minutes. It'll, it'll be like a black box in cars. Black boxes in planes record, I think, the last 30 minutes of electronics and the last 5 or 10 minutes of audio. So you'll have a driverless car, it'll do the same thing. It'll have a black box. And it'll record, actually right now cars have a similar thing to a black box some cars do some rental cars have a black box in them that can tell if you've been speeding that will report you to the rental agency for speeding so some cars already have a black box in it so the driverless cars the autonomous cars will have a black box that's recording all the data around them and then if it gets into an accident or if something happens it'll be able to play that information back to the authorities Yeah, Mac Band says, oh, yeah, if you're one of those assholes who decides to wait until 100 yards for the exit to get over, I'm not letting your ass in. No, I'm the same way. No way. If, if I'm going at a constant rate of speed and I see you signaling next to me, no, you slow down and go behind me. Don't expect me to slow down because you didn't plan ahead well enough. Sherry says, I love stick. Oh, yeah, where's that come from? Oh, yeah. Kim says, I believe everyone should learn to drive manual. You're not driving when you only know how to use automatic. Well, that's not true. You are driving. No, you're not. You're steering. <laughs> you're steering. It's not driving. It's the same thing. No, because you don't understand the physics of a vehicle as well as you do when you drive standard. No, people don't understand the physics no, of a vehicle. because that's why when you see a sharp corner, you see all these morons, like we have this highway section out here at Hurling, that slam their anchors on because it's a tight left curve. No, if you're going to do anything, gear down. If you can't, slow down before the curve and drive around the curve. But they don't know that because they're so used to just driving an automatic no, and no, steering. No, 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 no. Oh, my God, it's a sharp curve. I'm going to break. And then they fucking roll. 
No, it's not it, because in with a manual, you can use engine braking to slow yourself down or gearing down to slow yourself down. You no. can't do that with an automatic, so you have to brake. No, and that's why you need to learn how to drive a standard first. Why? Because then you understand the physics of how a vehicle reacts at speed and different speeds and curves and corners. People that only no, drive people, no, automatics no, 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 just no. steer. You're I guarantee that's why they fucking slam the brakes on when they shouldn't slam the brakes on. And they don't know how to drive. You're properly. making the assumptions that just because I, I, I drive a manual anything, I understand physics. That's not true at all. No, no. If you only drive automatic yes. and you've never driven a standard car, yes. I guarantee you are a shitty driver. No. That's got nothing, to do, it's got nothing to do with whether yep. you're a shitty driver or not. Guaranteed. I've seen shitty drivers drive in uh, manuals. Nope. I've seen good drivers drive automatics. Nope. It's got nothing to do with the car. It's got nope. everything to do with you. Nope, and nothing. physics has got nothing to do with whether you ride a manual car or an automatic no, you car. you understand No, you don't. How People don't understand. No, they don't. In a standard. No, I would disagree with that entirely. Well, they don't have a fucking clue when they drive automatics and don't but, understand. But people who have, who have drive manuals don't have a clue with the physics of the car either. Yeah, they do. No, they don't. Way more. No, yeah, they just, do. just because you drive a stick does not automatically give you by osmosis understanding of physics of a car but you have a better understanding you do <laughs> you don't because you have you know you have more control over it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know no such thing we were talking earlier about the um sorry what why am i getting flipped off because mm-hmm. i disagree with you no because you're wrong <laughs> when it comes to driving i know driving this one, the woman who slows down for curves on her motorcycle. You do, you do the exact same thing you accuse people in automatics of doing on your bike. You don't, no, understand, no, you don't understand no, the no, physics of your bike. No, they slam the brakes on. I don't slam the brakes on on my bike. <laughs> no, you slow down two miles. You slow down a quarter mile before. It's different. It's <laughs> different. We were I'm talking driving within <laughs> the limitations of my abilities because I'm a novice bike rider. We were talking before about uh, the Pope's visit to America. America. Talking about the Pope's visit to to America. To uh, America a few a few months ago, and the cute little car he was driving in. And someone tweeted, I thought this was a really interesting tweet that um, Wayne Dahlberg tweeted that this was his new favorite. Photograph, and I'm posting this to uh, to the IRC chat room for you folks who use folks. Listen to me like I'm from Pittsburgh all of a sudden. You folks who are in the chat room can check it out. It's a really interesting photo that he's posted um, that he calls my new favorite photo of all time. I'm going to post uh, put it up on the Your Mac Life show on, on, on the video feed. And I think this is an utterly fascinating picture. This is a group of people, I believe it was in Philadelphia, uh, as the Pope was was uh, driving through town. It might have been New York. I, I don't know, know exactly. But I love the fact that everybody in the picture is taking a picture or a video, except for that one little old lady down in the lower left-hand corner. And it illustrates a point I make in my classes of one of the big advantages of learning how to take better photographs is taking fewer photographs. W- one of the problems that beginners do is they sort of shotgun everything. They take a thousand pictures of the exact same thing, hoping that one of the thousand pictures will come out right. The more you know about taking better pictures, the fewer pictures you'll take because you'll know that your camera can capture that image. So, for example, if you've got uh, your iPhone out and you see a beautiful full moon, there's no point in taking a picture with your iPhone. It's not going to come out. Your iPhone just doesn't take good low-light pictures. doesn't take good moon pictures. So you know about what the shooting parameters of your iPhone are. Um, if you are at a racetrack and you want to take pictures of cars going by real fast, you know you'll need to do something to your camera up the shutter speed in order to capture that motion. So the more knowledge you have, the better pictures you take. And the fewer pictures you take. And what it will allow you to do is this thing that I call 
being in the photographic moment, it allows you to take the picture and then put the camera away to capture that moment, that photographic moment, but then put the camera away and become part of the moment to watch the Pope go by, to watch the concert, to listen to the band, take the one good picture, the two good pictures, whatever it might be, and then put the phone away, put the camera away. I used to, when I traveled, I would take 1,000, 2,000 pictures. I'd go to a Macworld Expo, and over the four days of a Macworld Expo, I would literally take 4,000 pictures. And I'd probably get maybe five decent ones. Kim and I went to Mexico a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago. We were there for a week. I had three cameras with me at all times. I had a camera. I had an underwater camera. I had my iPhone. I had my, my DSLR. I only took about 300 photos, 400 photos. And... A hundred of those were Kim in a bikini. Because I'm not stupid. So I'm taking fewer photos. And what that means is I spend less time with my eye jammed to this screen and more time being in the moment, event, area, beach, party, ball game, whatever it might be, and enjoying the actual moment as opposed to enjoying, quote-unquote, enjoying the moment on a small screen. You see people do this all the time. You see people in this picture. They're literally looking up at their screen. Obviously, they're, <clears throat> they're, uh, they're framing the shot in their screen, but they're not seeing the moment in real life. They're seeing it filtered or seeing it through the lens of some sort of device. And if you're recording it, people are often, when they're recording video, looking at the screen and nothing else. So learn more about photography. Learn more about what your camera can and can't do because that knowledge will allow you to take fewer pictures, take better pictures, to take pictures faster, and to give you more time to be in that place that you're at, to enjoy that walk, to smell the flowers, to talk to the person you're with as opposed to constantly taking pictures. If you have any questions about anything we talk about here on the show or about photography, I always happy to answer any kind of photography questions you guys might have. Send me emails to sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. Do you have that problem? Do you, you, you don't have that problem, do you, Kim? You, you don't take too many photos, do you? No. you? You seem to be pretty good about... I take them, and even like every few weeks, I'll go through them all and I'll go, yeah, that one doesn't do anything for me, and I delete it. So I only have around four, ooh, 500 max phone photos on my iPhone. It's something we should talk more about. It's maybe some other show um, about how you edit your photos. Mm -hmm. Do you use any other app besides the photo app to edit them, to crop them? To, on to my your, iPhone? On your iPhone, yeah. Nope. We should start getting you into using some other apps and telling the audience about them. But because I, I like the Apple one. I, <laughs> I know that, but... There might be other apps that can do more things for you or that are good or bad or better or worse mm -hmm. that you can tell the audience about. Like a little mm -hmm. review of... If, if, I, if I was doing something where I was going to print them, maybe. But most of the time, I just look at them on my iPhone. Do you post them to Facebook very much? No, not very often. So I most... I do the Facebook drama thing yeah, very yeah, often. I understand. Yeah. But so, and, and, and you post them to Twitter every, every now and then. Sometimes. So most of the photos that you're taking are for your own personal me. use at some other Just point. Me. So when would you look at them? If you, if, if you took a photo six months ago that you liked, would you go back and look at that photo? for? I look at my photos often. Really? Mm -hmm. You just flip through them to yeah, Pinterest? Yeah, all my puppy dogs. Well, remember there's that app. I don't know. I, think we, I know we talked about it called Heyday that does that diary journaling thing. Mm -hmm. no, I don't want that. You don't I, want that? I like to be able to just go back and... Because because Apple and iPhone, when you click on it, it says the date you took it. Yeah. Yes. It's gonna be like, oh, that was then. It's like, oh yeah. But remember, Heyday shows you where you took it too. It'll show you on a map where you took your photos. I know where I was when okay. I took the picture. Someone someone <laughs> mentioned that. Um, uh, I was having a conversation with a photographer on on Twitter, and they were complaining about the fact that not all new cameras have GPS on them have ge what's called geolocation. Mm -hmm. When you take a picture, the camera knows physically where you, where you were. Mm -hmm. And the iPhone does that and some other, other phones do that and other cameras do that. 
And I thought that's never been a concern for me because as bad as my memory is, I know the exact spot I was for every photo I've ever taken. I have a really shitty memory, but you show me a photo, I know exactly where I was. Mm -hmm. And I could probably go back and find that place. Yeah. There's not a single photo I've ever seen of, that I've taken where I've gone, geez, I wonder where I took that. I wonder where that was. No, I know exactly where every single one of them was. I'm the same. That's why GPS has never been a, a big deal for me. Brian Monroe says, Photoshop fix. You like it, Sean? I haven't played with it enough. I'm going to. Uh, both the new version of Lightroom and the new version of Photoshop Fix. I'll be playing around with both of those in the next couple of weeks and uh, uh, give a report on the show. Uh, email. Send us emails, as always, to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com if you want us to read them on the show this evening or any other evening, or to my email address, sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. Just, oh, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, Frank. Frank says, just wanted a quick opinion from the experts. Currently running iOS 8.4 and both iPhone 6 and both iPads. We are leaving shortly for a trip abroad. Do you recommend updating to 9.0.2 now or wait until we return? What do you think the answer to that should be? Wait until you return. If Why? You, if you want to use it, well, what if you fuck something up? <laughs> That's exactly it. Brian Monroe, update now. Brian Monroe, our resident geek, you're wrong. Do not, do not update. It's like I don't update software the day before or the day of a show. If you're about to go on a vacation, don't update your phone just ahead. If your phone works fine. This is under the assumption that the guy's phone works just absolutely fine. Why do you need to update anything? You don't, unless there's something in the update that you desperately want and need while you're on vacation, Yeah. don't update. Because what happens if, God forbid, the thing dies on you? What if, it, if something happens in the update that bricks your phone? You'd be screwed. You wouldn't be able to get to an Apple store when you're in Marrakesh. No, no, don't update at all until until you get back from vacation. Do not do that. Uh, photography question from um, Queenie. Queenie. All right. I'm, I'm assuming that's your right name. Um, how do I know what ISO F stops, et cetera, to use under different lighting circumstances? You don't. Actually, you do. You know the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Uh, what did you say? F stops or iOS? You said iOS. F, -S F stops and I ISO. Oh, right. Okay. You, you, you get there. You, you learn the exact same way as you get to Carnegie Hall. By just doing it. No. You, you don't know the, the line. No. Guy walks up to a guy with a violin, walks up to another guy with a violin and says, uh, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? The guy says, practice, practice, practice. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. That's, that's, that's how you do it. You can learn. It's called the exposure triangle. And it's shutter speed versus aperture and ISO. And <clears throat> what you need to do is understand what those things, those three things, like every triangle, it always have to. I didn't know this until, I guess probably grade seven. Do you know what every triangle, its internal angles have to add up to? Yeah. What? Can't remember off the top of my head. Two seventy. Yeah. This is two seventy or one eighty. Isosceles triangle. Shit. One eighty. Mac man. One one eighty. Yeah. Hundred eighty degrees. So just like I, just like a triangle has to, every internal angle has to be hundred eighty degrees. Your f stop. Your aperture and your ISO have to all equal out. And so you have to learn what those things are. You have to learn what those things do and how they affect your photographs. And you have to practice and practice and practice. And what will happen is after X numbers of literally thousands of shots, you'll be able to look at a scene and look at it and you go, okay, the light is like this. Um, the person is or isn't moving. The 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 sun is coming from here. My uh, uh, it's this time of day. Uh, all the kind of stuff, and you'll be able to go boom, and get the shot in the first one or two shots. If assuming everything else is equal, I can now let's say I'm going to shoot a person, just a, a person's face. I see someone. What was that? You're shooting a person. <laughs> yeah. If if I was just just uh, taking a portrait of somebody. Um, now I know instantly I want to shoot an aperture uh, f4, I want to shoot an ISO 200, and I want to shoot a shutter speed of 500, one, one 500. 
Now look at that picture, and I'll see the picture. It's something. It's too dark. It's too light. It's too blurry. Whatever it is, I'll be able to make real quick adjustments. But it's all about practice. That's the only thing I can tell you is that there's no magic formula that says this, this, and this. Even your camera isn't perfect. Your camera will give you advice that's sometimes wrong, too. You'll take a picture with your camera, and even though the settings in the camera were correct according to the camera, it didn't, it didn't come out very, very well. Uh, Steve Overton, uh, this is for Monty. Um, Skitch will let you import a photo and annotate it. So check that out. Thanks, Steve. And also, uh, Lauren Finkelstein says, Monty was looking for an app to draw a circle or a box around something in a photo. The obvious answer is Pixelmator. I was surprised you didn't recommend it, as I thought I'd learned about it from you. You probably did, Lauren. I just never tried that aspect of Pixelmator. To me, Pixelmator was an image editor. I never thought about adding text or things like that to it. Anyway, Pixelmator lets you manipulate pictures in many ways, the most basic of which does include adding circles and arrows and such, each in its own layer. It's not free. It's five bucks, but well worth it. I absolutely agree. The, the, the iOS version of Pixelmator is a, a fantastic app, Lauren. So, uh, Monty, there's two, Skitch and Pixelmator. Um, it's an old email from our friend Scott Randall there in Long Island. He said, my, my suggestion of trying burnt Brussels sprouts was not meant to be condescending at all. My son, whose degree is in culinary arts, has a passion for cooking. Because of him, we have tried things we never otherwise would have and found them great. I know there's something I'm forgetting here. Anyway, I'm one of the nerds you always talk about, like when you get in discussion of MAH or milliamp hours. I'm proud to be a nerdy type, while not actually as smart as some. The Wikipedia definition classifies them as socially awkward, which is not always true. Anyway. I'm not going to attempt to explain an email what you would take a couple of weeks of physics class to explain. You know that the prefix milli means one thousandth, so one one thousandth of an ampere. That's not really important. Uh, MAH is a unit contrived by the industry so people can get an approximate idea of how much charge their device battery contains. Okay, It's really an equivalent of the number of electrons that are stored in the battery. Depending on what the particular app has to do, your device will use more or fewer of the electrons to do the work in a fixed amount of time. Sean, why this is relevant to your discussion with Kim is that she may indeed have her phone charged last two days because what she is doing does not require as much current. Aha, I got it now. Current is measured by the number of electrons flowing past a specific point per unit of time. I try to explain this without going through a long explanation of electrical theory. Hope it is helpful. Thank you very much, Scott. I didn't, didn't understand that before. Uh, Jason Painter in Australia says, I would definitely play casual games. I play a number of these on my iPad. I wouldn't buy it primarily for games. I use it mainly to watch content from my iTunes library and from streaming services. You only play one game on your on your iPhone, don't you? Mm, once Wh in a blue moon. Which one is it? Bejeweled Be Blitz. Bejeweled Blitz which makes them, you, you like it just because it makes a hell of yeah, a lot of noise. Yeah, fucking noise. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like, you don't play any of You don't play card games. You don't play... Other mix mix and match games. You don't play no. word games. Anything else like that. No. Uh, I used to play a lot of words with friends. I don't anymore. The only game I play on a regular basis on my iPhone is threes. So I'm still addicted to threes. I don't really play games on my iPad anymore. I think it would depend on what games come to the Apple TV and what situation you're in. For example, if you regularly had friends come over for drinks, mm. maybe games on the Apple TV could be kind of fun. I like uh, educational stuff. I like those. I like quiz up. I like um, mm. question the answer. You know, common like yeah, general knowledge. But imagine, kind of do, do you know what you know what Pictionary is? Yeah. Imagine Pictionary on your Apple TV. Yeah, where the game right. would be on the TV and the drawing would be hap yeah. would happen on, on, yeah, on the TV. Yeah, I with the kids. So yeah. Or games yeah, like Monopoly. Yeah. You could play Monopoly on your big screen TV with your mm -hmm. your uh, iPhone as as the controller. I can see games. Except when there's a power outage. <coughs> Except when there's a power. Because that's when we used to play all our games. <laughs> when there's a power <laughs> outage. By candlelight. Well, you can't play it on your <laughs> Apple TV or your iPhone. And it's in. Actually, when we were kids, we we kind of liked Power Up. We had them on a regular basis in Nova Scotia because that did mean that you got to sit down with mom and dad and play games. We, we did. We used to do yeah. something as stupid as just 
flick the dictionary and put your finger in. Jeez, and just read a word and go, okay, nerdy. you had to know what it meant. That's pretty nerdy. No, it's not nerdy. It's smart. Um, so, yeah, I think those kind of – but I, I don't see me sitting down in front of my Apple TV and playing a game by myself off the Apple TV. By myself? Yeah, would you play Bejeweled Blitz on the Apple TV? Ooh, that'd be big. <laughs> <laughs> be a hell of a surround uh, sound, the whole deal. No, probably. Yeah, not. and I, I can't see me playing threes no. on the Apple TV. It no. doesn't need that kind hand, of thing. It's a hand. It's a little yeah. game. I yeah. think the Apple TV games, by their nature, the more successful ones are going to be more social, I think, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But then again, a lot of folks. Interactive. Thing and a lot of folks like playing by themselves too. I mean, for example, I I wouldn't even when I had an Xbox, I never played online against other people, mm-hmm. against random strangers on the internet. I yeah, would see never the kids do that. Dead all the time. Yeah, I see. I don't want to get beaten by a fourteen year old in Iowa or Germany. Yeah, oh, exactly. It just pisses me off. You're gonna beat me. Be in the same goddamn room as me. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, for me too, games are social for me. I like mm-hmm. games that have a social aspect to them, yeah. not just a competitive aspect to them. I like games where you can sit around a table. You and I and Matt have played um, uh, Farkle, which mm-hmm. is a game we like to play. You and I play play backgammon. Mm-hmm. I love playing poker. Mm-hmm. All those games yeah. are yeah, I like social games. Social aspect. Yeah. Even though you could play those on a TV screen, the other aspect of it is you do get to physically mm-hmm. move pieces around. And you see people's reactions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, DJ McIntyre says, the cool thing is the new Apple TV SDK is pretty similar to develop for iPhone or iPad. Some frameworks are not available. So what he's saying is basically it's going to be easy to do those games if it's available on the iPad or the iPhone to make them available on the Apple TV too. Mm. So if you, if there, there may very well be a Bejeweled Blitz <laughs> for the Apple TV. Um, this is a long-awaited, my apologies uh, for this one being so long. Um, Roddy Paws tells us about, remember he had the picture of the dogs a while back that you liked so much? The one I saw today? No, this was a couple weeks ago. The dogs. I see lots of dog pictures. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the, what the cat, what the context of the dog pictures was. Hang on a second, let me just open this up and I'll show the audience. What was his name again? Uh, uh, David, uh, Roddy Paws is his uh, online, online name for some reason. This, there we go. Stella is my dog, he says. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mako is her dad who visits sometimes. You ask why I got my dogs to pose in that photo. I'll remember he had the, he had the dogs posed with the, with the, with the glasses on. Mm-hmm. Um, I really didn't do anything for the photo. Haley was giving birth on the floor. Mako and Stella were on the bed watching. That part was real. I grabbed my phone, took a photo. I added the popcorn and 3D glasses later and with Photoshop. Ah, mm-hmm. he cheated. Mm-hmm. He That's cheated. Not cheating. That's just being artistic. He works for a company called Dogline, which makes harnesses, including ones for service dogs. Oh, cool. um, he takes uh, this dog, Haley, uh, to work with him every day. Um, she is a pit bull mastiff mix. Here she is oh, in nice. her service vest. Let me just see if I can't pull this up real She's quick a big so girl. You, guys can, you guys can see Haley in her it's service vest. Pit bull mastiff. She'll probably be big girl. She's very oh, pretty. She's Look good. at her. Oops, oops, oops. Ah. <gasps> Oh, she is pretty. She's pretty. Yeah, good looking dog. Very good looking girl. Oh. Smart. For Kim, I love dogs more than people too. Counting puppies, there are fourteen in my apartment right now with no people living here. Oh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I would be happy, you, happy, you, happy. Oh shit, I didn't I didn't even post the picture. I'm sorry. There's the picture. Kim and I can see the picture, but you guys couldn't see the picture. There's I the picture the of picture. Stella. Yes, you can. Oh. I thought you meant fourteen. No, 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 no. That would be a good one. That would be a good one. Yes. Thanks very much for the email, David. Yeah, she's a good-looking girl. Uh, Lauren Finkelstein, my process used to be that periodically I would plug my iPhone into my computer, offload all the pics, delete them from my camera roll, only syncing back the ones I wanted on the phone. Now I have iCloud Photo Library. I have my Mac set to download full resolution copies of everything. And I have my iPhone set to optimize iPhone storage. So, what I want to know is, when does it get to the optimized part? In the time since I started that, my phone has been slowly filling up. I used to keep about 10 to 15 gigs free, and this weekend it went below 1. 
until I was able to clear out some podcasts and get back up to four. My photos are taking up about 10 gigs, and that's just going to grow. Do you know anyone who has any idea what Apple's Apple's algorithm for removing the local copies from the phone to free up space? When does it kick in? Is there any way to force it? I don't, Lauren, but I've asked, obviously, the audience, maybe someone in the audience knows, because I don't use iCloud Photo Library. I find that whole cloud thing with Apple, I just don't trust it. What I do for my photos is I put them on drops. I put them on Dropbox, and I put them um, on a local hard drive, and I put them on Flickr, and then I use some other testing services, copy and other syncing services to to have other copies of them too. So if I want to see my photos and I have internet access, I can look at them on Dropbox, I can look at them on Flickr, I can look at them on other places. I don't go through the, the hoops that uh, you're going through. Any reason to, hang on, wait, wait, wait. oh, my 90-year-old mother, this is from Alex Canton. My 90-year-old mother is running Mavericks on her year-old iMac. All she does is Safari and Apple Mail, nothing else. I mean, nothing else. Is there any reason to upgrade to Yosemite? I'm thinking that it is always best to be up to date for security reasons, since I'm 3,000 miles away from her, but not this week. Mm. I'm also thinking it might be easier to upgrade to El Capitan when it comes out, or now that it has come out. Should I upgrade to Yosemite now for security or other reasons? <clears throat> I would say for security, yes, unfortunately. But it's not like your mom is, is doing anything dangerous. The problem is she might click on a link that oh, takes no, her to a bad surfing. site. She's on the internet. She, she, so, she, yeah. she might. What I would do is make sure that Mavericks, the version of Mavericks you have, has got the latest and greatest software updates then something else you could do is make sure you've got screen sharing turned on so that way if your mom does have a problem you can screen share from where you are into her laptop or into her iMac the other thing you want to do is make sure your mom has uh, either remote or local backups that are done automatically so if something does happen you can re- you can just wipe the iMac, and reload from the from the latest backup, backup from an hour ago or the backup from yesterday, thereby not losing too much of 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 your mom's stuff. The problem is, your mom's ninety and she's running Mavericks on an iMac. Good for mom, but she's also ninety. She may not want you messing with her computer. Ask your mom. Find out if she wants to do this. Explain the pros and cons. Explain the fact that there are maybe some security issues. But if mom says, you know, I don't do anything except Safari and mail, I never click on links unless you send them to me, leave your mom alone. If she's happy with the way the computer's running, leave mom alone. Yeah, uh, 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 DJ McIntosh, El Capitan greatly improved performance. Uh, screen sharing requires port forwarding. Um, so, yeah, if, if screen sharing works, definitely, definitely turn it on. But mom may not care about performance, guys. This is she's ninety. <laughs> uh, Scott Thrift in Sydney, Australia. This is a fairly old email. Sorry, Scott. Uh, I have a. V- it was interesting to hear you and Jim discussing weight loss and the Apple Watch. I have a very dear friend who was in danger of imminent death due to weight loss, due to weight issues. He weighed almost two hundred and eighty kilograms, folks. That's almost that's more than five hundred pounds. That's not good. He had huge issues keeping up his motivation and trying to track food. 30 of us got together and got him an Apple Watch with a tracking app you talked about, Success. Using the app to help keep track of calorie intake, he's managed to lose 40 kilograms. Wow. Good for him. Scott, please pass along our congratulations to your friend. That's that's amazing. Yeah, that's, see, just walking. Like, walking helps yeah. so much. It, it makes a huge difference. Just the little things. Yeah. One of the problems, we and we've talked about this before on, on the show, one of the problems is because of any number of reasons, society and other things, we think we have to lose it all now. Mm-hmm. I have to be 20 pounds skinnier in a week. Oh, we think we have to go to the gym nine to, you know, every day for an hour or whatever. But you don't. Like, literally, just watch your little pedometer thing, your walk thing on your Apple phone or watch, and you go... Okay. Oh, I only walked two kilometers. Well, oh, that didn't seem much. Maybe I can do three or four yep. tomorrow. And that's how you. One of the things is we set ourselves up for failure that way. 
By saying I've got to lose 20 pounds by the end of the week, yeah. you're not going to lose that unless you lose a body part. You set yourself up for failure, and you go, well, screw it. I can't be bothered. I, this, this is stupid. Mm. But don't even do that. Don't even. One of the problems, this is something I was always on Kim about. She weighed herself every single day. And that's the problem. <laughs> it, is it, Unless you were intensely working out and focusing on it, that's what's going to happen. Your weight goes up, it goes down. It goes up by a pound, it goes down by two. It goes up by three, it goes down by one. Eh, it happens. So what you do is just start doing some kind of exercise for six months. And it could be as simple as walking. Literally, as simple as walking. Like Kim said, two kilometers, two miles, whatever it is. Just go out and walk. Go tomorrow and take go download the pedometer app it's called pedometer plus plus it's free install that in your phone go walk just walk until you don't want to walk anymore and come back and then look at your pedometer and see how far that is you'll be surprised how far you can walk in half an hour in 45 minutes i think kim and i the first time we did it we walked down the end of our block out here in the country we have huge blocks and back again it was five kilometers and it wasn't a hard walk except for the fact it was 95 degrees outside we did in the middle of the summertime yeah. it wasn't a hard walk that was an easy walk for us to do five kilometers so next time we did seven and then we did eight and then when we were down in mexico walking 75 kilometers over the week wasn't nearly as hard as i, th- as I thought it was going to be because we had been practicing beforehand and it helped us lose weight so just do that for six months just walk for half an hour for six months 45 mm-hmm. minutes for six months you i guarantee Assuming you eat the same way you do now, you're not, you know, cramming your face full of mm-hmm. chili dogs. Yeah. It's got to be in combination. You have to eat less and exercise more. It's fairly simple. You can still eat the exact same stuff, just eat less of it. That's another key, too. Put less food on your plate. You can still have a hamburger. Maybe you only eat half the hamburger or don't eat the fries. Or when you have dinner, take a little less food. Make sure half your food, half your plate is vegetables, whether it's a salad or whether it's you know, vegetables, carrots and green beans and Brussels sprouts, whatever else you, you might want to do. Six months, guarantee you'll be, you'll have lost weight. And then you can start looking at, hey, maybe I want to start running. Or maybe I want to actually join a gym or a pool and start swimming. Or join a walking club where I'm walking with more people. Or walk with friends virtually online. Uh, Nike allows you to do this. Nike allows you to use their app and it uploads the data to a website, and you and your friends can track each other and encourage each other and or compete against each other hmm. over the same distances or the same, even the same paths. So it's a bunch of different ways to do it. But, yeah, you, you, you got to start doing something if you want to lose weight. You can't just expect that someone's going to get a, a pill and this is all going to magically happen for us. But so we'd like that. Not going to happen. I want to say thanks very much to our friend Jim Downpour from The Loop at loopinsight.com for joining us here this evening. Thanks to you guys for being here, as always, whether you're listening in live or listening into the archive. Send emails to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com. Until next week, as always, I've been Sean King. And I'm Kim Guy. And you've been listening to Your Mac Life. Thanks for joining us, folks. See ya!